The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. And Frederick Engels. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. The powers of old Europe have entered into a, a holy alliance to exercise this spirit. Pope and Tsar, Metternich and Guza, French radicals and German police spies. Where is the party in opposition that has not decried as communistic its opponents in power? Where the opposition that has not hurled back at the branding reproach of communism against the more advanced oppositional parties, as well as against the reactionary adversaries? Two things result from this fact. One, communism is already acknowledged by all European powers to be itself a power. Two, it is high time that communists should openly, in the face of the whole world, publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tale of the specter of communism with a manifesto of the party itself. To this end, the communists of various nationalities have assembled in London and sketched the following manifesto to be published in English, French, German, Italian, Flemish, and Danish languages. 1. Bourgeois and Proletarians the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freemen and slaves, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman. In a word, oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden and now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstruction of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. And almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinctive feature. It has simplified the class antagonisms. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. From the serfs of the Middle Ages sprang the chattered burghers of the earliest towns. From these burgesses, the first elements of the bourgeoisie were developed. The discovery of America, the rounding of the Cape, opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. The East India and Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, the increase in the means of exchange and in commodities generally, gave to commerce, to navigation, to industry, an impulse never before known, and thereby to the revolutionary element in the tottering feudal society, a rapid development. The feudal system of industry, in which industrial production was monopolized by closed guilds, now no longer sufficed for the growing markets. The manufacturer system took its place. The guildmasters were pushed aside by the manufacturing middle class. Division of labor between the different corporate guilds vanished in the face of the division of labor in each single workshop. Meantime, the markets kept ever growing, the demand ever rising. Even manufacture no longer sufficed, whereupon steam and machinery revolutioned industrial production. The place of the manufacturer was taken by the giant modern industry. The place of the industrial middle class by industrial millionaires, the leaders of the whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeoisie. Modern industry has established the world market for which the discovery of America paved the way. This market has given an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communicate land. This development has, in its turn, reacted on the extension of industry and in proportion as industry, commerce, navigation, railways extended, in the same proportion the bourgeoisie developed, increased its capital, and pushed into the background every class handed down from the Middle Ages. 
We see, therefore, how the modern bourgeoisie is itself a product of a long course of development, of a series of revolutions in the modes of production and of exchange. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of the class. An oppressed class, under the sway of the feudal nobility, it became an armed and self-governing association in the medieval commune. Here, independent urban republic, as in Italy and Germany, they a taxable third estate of the monarchy, as in France, afterwards in the period of manufacture proper, serving either the semi-feudal or the absolute monarchy as counterposed against the nobility, and in fact cornerstone of the great monarchies in general, the bourgeoisie has at last, since the establishment of modern industry and of the world market, conquered for itself in the modern representative state, exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but the, a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie has played a most revolutionary role in history. The bourgeoisie, whatever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has piteously torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors, and has left no other bond between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. It has downed the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism, in the icy water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefeasible charted freedoms, has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation, veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil and has reduced the family relations into a mere money relation. The bourgeoisie has disclosed how it came to pass that the brutal display of vigor in the Middle Ages, which reactionaries so much admire, found its fitting complement in the most slothful indolence. It has been the first to show that man's activity can bring about. It has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former migrations of nations and crusades. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production, and thereby the relations of production, and with them the whole relations of society. Conservation of the old modes of production in unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of the existence of all earlier industrial classes. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguished the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed, fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away all new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is so solid melts into the air. All that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. The need of constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. The bourgeoisie has through its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. To the great chagrin of reactionaries, it has drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. All old established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. They are dislodged by new industries whose introductions become a life and death question for all civilized nations by industries that no longer work up indigenous raw material, but raw material drawn from the remotest zones, industries whose products are consumed not only by at home, but in every quarter of the globe. 